Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 59 of the Anime Banter Podcast with your hosts, Turtle, Mike, and me, Sean. Thank you for joining us today. How are you guys doing? My brain feels like it's in my feet because I've been in work calls literally from 8 a.m. until 4 o'clock today. So if I'm, and if I'm nonsensical today, that's why. I actually had a day off, so uh, I'm feeling pretty great. And Mike, was that a Spaceballs reference? You know it. My brains are going into my feet. My brains are going into my feet. Well, I hope you guys are ready. Uh, Because of our uh, busy, busy lives, uh, we usually give you guys about 10 minutes of uh, what we call quick banter, where we discuss the things happening in our lives and other nerdy hobbies we have. However, uh, we're skipping that today and going straight to solo leveling because we are busy, busy people. (laughs) Uh, So expect today's episode to be a little shorter than usual. Episode 9. You've been hiding your skills. We hit the ground running this episode. The three prisoners from last episode are absolutely crushing some goblins. One of them fights with nunchucks, another, I think, a bow staff, and the last one with some spiked knuckles. They're really enjoying it. Chiyo Sung and Juhi note how much Jin, uh, Jinu has changed, and we go to the opening theme. I really dug the starting this episode off with a nice biz- bit of action. Also, the spiked knuckle guys, guys should have been using either like a sword or... Uh, Raphael's weapon from Turtles, and we could have had a nice Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle reference. Oh, that's a good call. I didn't think about that. But these criminals seem pretty strong. But I and crazy. I, yeah. Well, yeah. That. <laughs> I also like how Mister Song was able to tell Jin Jinu was had like a different aura about him. Like he just looked at him, he could tell. You know, not the fact that he grew like six feet and has a chiseled jawline or anything out of the blue. But like he could tell, like looking at him, it's like, oh, there's a different aura about you. Yeah, I certainly didn't mind them starting off with a bit of action. But when the ending, uh, when the opening theme is over, the party comes to a clearing with three separate tunnels. Gino, using his perception, knows the boss is down to the left side. The prisoners in their babysitter, Taishi Kong, go to the right. Mr. Kim and... Red bandana man whose name I've forgotten. Go down the middle. Uh, and for some reason, just those two off on their own gives me the heebie-jeebies. I feel like something bad's going to happen. I was going to say, did, like, Song Sheik was like, oh, Jin, Jinu is here. It's all good. We're, we're fine. It's like, dude, did you not learn from the last time you went on a raid with him? Like, shit went down. Like, this is just screaming death flags. In the middle path... Mr. Kim and Red Bandana Man discuss how Mr. Kim wants to apologize to Jinu when this is all over. I was not expecting the somber moment of Song Shi saying he wanted to apologize to Jinu, like, and him saying, I don't expect Jinu to accept my apology. Like, I was a little taken aback by that moment. I guess because, like, because Jinu kind of, like, landed on his feet and is actually, like, in a better place now than he's ever been in his life. Like, to me, like, I cut, I kind of write off how horrible it was that, like, he left him to die. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's a, maybe like a survivorship bias thing, but, like, Jinu pretty much died. And, um, you know, it's easy to maybe think, oh, yeah, of course he'll forgive him, but, like, he's really under no obligation to. He's like, dude, you, like, I could still have the system now and not have died. Uh, if you'd just stuck around and looked at the monsters while the timer went out. I think it definitely speaks a lot of his character, too, where, you know, he he is sorry. And it was a it was a horrible situation all the way around. So the fact that he, you know, wants to apologize just says a lot about his character. And I, I think of him in a little better light now. On the path to the right, the prisoners are discussing how cartoonishly villainous they are saying that humans and monsters are no different than each other and that a kill is a kill. I'm like, man, this is this is like cartoon villainy. One should be twirling a mustache. They have no depth <laughs> at all. Mustache twirl. There's a cutaway uh, to uh, Taishi Kong speaking with a man who explains that three men assaulted his daughter and caused her to take her own life. His wife was also hospitalized due to the shock. He's offering Tai Shi Kong 
three billion dollars to kill the three prisoners. Now, you know, this is where we discussed before that three billion dollars is not actually three billion dollars necessarily. Um, you know what I mean? Like, the, you have to get take into consideration, um, like the the conversion from Korean yen, right? So, three billion dollars uh, is still a lot of money. It's still about uh, two point two million U.S. dollars, but it seems that the the offer is a lot more reasonable, right? That like I don't know, Elon Musk didn't sell a bunch of Tesla shares or Bezos didn't sell a bunch of Amazon shares and roll up with that much money. You know, you're like, okay, $2.2 million seems a lot more attainable than $2.2 billion. And it's because of the conversion rate, probably, from uh, Korean currency to U.S. currency. Uh, anyway, uh, what happens in the dungeon... Oh, so th this guy also says, he says, what happens in the dungeon stays in the dungeon, after all. And all I could think was, apparently, even people outside the dungeons know that? I, I wouldn't think anyone outside of being a hunter would know that. There's a... They're checking out the dark web, getting they're reading reading all the conspiracy theory websites. Well, you know, now that you mention it, Mike, actually, uh, hunters are, uh, you know, we think about like uh, shows like My Hero Academia and Tiger and Bunny, where like, um, there's a good chance that the public actually kind of knows, like, they get interviewed and things like that. The most prominent hunters actually do kind of have a presence. So, and obviously, with how much there, there, there's this stigma. It's like, um, what do you call it? When you ask a high schooler today, what do you want to do for a living? And they say, I want to be an influencer. And everyone rolls their eyes. I feel like a lot of a lot of kids here in this universe are probably saying, I want to be a hunter because they get rich. You know what I mean? And um, so it, it's probably something like that where like uh, hunters are like almost minor celebrities and people that other people look up to. Um, so if you actually may know a surprising amount about hunter culture, it wouldn't surprise me if a number of hunters weren't famous on social media and they just don't show that aspect. I could see that. Also, I'm assuming this was the random cutaway guy from last episode where we got that weird ass like five second cutaway. Please kill them. Did we really need that cutaway from the last time? I know I mentioned it in our last episode that we recorded, uh, but that that was completely unnecessary. And that's exactly what we were talking about with these random cutaways. They're, they're, they're not needed. We didn't need to know about that scene until now when it actually is important to the story going forward. So hopefully we're done with these cutaways. They're, they're, they were killing me. We talked about this last week about how, you know, we hyperanalyze everything. And, you know, like I, I'm writing a script for myself for these episodes, kind of giving me some general points to talk about. And like, if I didn't talk about these cutaways... I wouldn't even remember that that happened. So, I don't know. Very bizarre. They make some questionable directing choices here. It just, the flow feels not great. I mean, maybe it's new studio. Like, we like we know this is from Korea, so maybe it's just a, they're, them still getting their feet wet on, like, the flow of things. Because I know, like, Korea has been putting out some bigger video games of late um liza p and stellar blade and like people are like yeah these are great games to like get their foot in the door like they're like solid seven eight out of ten type games but these games will be remembered for opening the door for korean studios for to make games and this will be uh definitely remembered probably as one of the ones that opens the door for a lot of korean shows not too many anime are made after manhwa and like web comics and um, like light novels out of Korea. So um, this could really, this is one of the biggest of all time, I think, uh, in terms of popularity out of that country in this, in this medium. So yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to more. Listen, I don't really care the origin of a, um, like of a show, as long as it's good. You know, if you give me good animation, and you can give me like good story and characters. Sign me up. It could be from uh, France, South Africa. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, Korea, uh, Canada. You know, give me, give me wherever. Just give me a good show. From Russia with love. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and honestly, the animation for the show has been really good. I think they're they're doing a great job with this. So uh, hopefully, this will continue, and we'll get more shows. And, you know, from all over the world, I, I 
like you said, as long as it's a good story, the animation's good, I, I want to see what's happening. So let's do it. When we return to the cave, Tai Chi Kong explains that he's going to murder the prisoners and just say that it was a hundred goblins in a horde. We cut back to the middle path team who find out that the middle and right paths connect. What great luck. They walk right into the scene of Tai Chi Kong torturing and killing the three prisoners. The middle path party calls out, what's going on? And Tai Chi Kong walks towards them with his knife. Back to the left tunnel party. Gina recaps that Tai Chi Kong visited him in the hospital. They hear a scream and run towards it. The middle party is all dead except for Mr. Kim, who is clinging to dear life. Juhi attempts a heal, and it's not necessarily a bad job, but he's just too far gone. Mr. Kim gets to apologize to Jinu before passing on. I was surprised that Jinu was able to heal sang at all. Like, it looked like he was dead when they entered that room. So the fact that they were, she was able to even get a basic heal was very surprising. And, like, Mr. Kim apologizes, and Jinu's like, no, I can't forgive you. And, like, he's pissed off that he's gonna die. Because then who's he gonna blame moving forward? That's a very emotional moment. While mourning uh, the passing of Mr. Kim, Taishi Kong attempts a sneak attack on Ju He. It makes sense to go always take the healer out first. But it's blocked by Jinu. Uh, he, re- he reveals that he has the perfect story. The prisoners plotted escape. They killed the whole party first, and then they were killed by Taishi Kong. You know, it's, a, it's a good narrative. Good to know that even the Hunters Association, Hunters are corrupt AF. And like, even Mr. Song was surprised by this. Chiu Song decides, uh, well, they have to defend themselves, right? Um, to Chiu Song, there's just a healer who's not good at fighting, right? Because healers can't really do it. And then there's an E rank. And he's like, crap. He's like, I have to do this. <laughs> uh, it was actually kind of nice that they cut away to him last episode uh, doing Kendo. Because we know that he, even though apparently he is a mage type hunter, uh, he knows how to use a sword, like real techniques. So even with one arm, he's going to fight Tai Chi Kong with a sword. He asked Juhi to give him a strength buff, and uh, when the fight starts, he's actually doing pretty well. I thought it was pretty cool that Juhi was able to, like, apply buffs, like, more than just healing spells. It's like, oh, she's our healer, okay, you're just around to heal us. It's like, oh, no, she's actually able to do more than just heal, which is cool. And I really enjoyed this whole fight sequence. It's just animated really well, and I was very interested in in following you know the back and forth between these two characters so it's 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 a very great very great scene uh juhi heals chiel song after taking a wound uh taisha kong goes after juhi but he's stopped by chiel song who uh you know really calls him out for he's like you're really gonna turn your back on an opponent and uh almost gets a hit in uh, but unfortunately, Chiu Song starts losing the fight by getting cut multiple times. Juhi attempts to heal him more. And there's a moment where I can't tell if she runs out of energy or if it was one of those like mental blocks that she's been having. But she's not able to heal him anymore and then just falls to the ground. I think it was a mental block because it feels like she just like she felt surprised. She's like, oh, and like it almost felt like how much of it is the PTSD that she's experiencing playing into her healing magic, not working. I agree. I, I think that's exactly what's happening. Just the, the amount of fear she has of losing her life in a dungeon just completely has overwhelmed her. And I, if, I believe that this was the first dungeon she's been in since the double dungeon. I think she's been too afraid to do it. So she finally is like, you know, I'm going to give this a shot and try again. And then this happens. The, the poor girl, she's, she's just, you know, she just can't get over this. And, and I don't blame her. I don't know if I would be able to either. Yeah, we see her at that monster fight out on the streets, but I think it seems like this is her first dungeon. Yeah. So she's she's having a rough time. Understandably so. Uh, Chiu Song kind of lures in Tai Chi Kong with almost like a false sense of security. Tai Chi Kong realizes he's winning, gets a little cocky. 
And when Shio Song gets him exactly where he wants him, he unleashes a huge flame magic attack, uh, which looked pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the plan didn't work. <laughs> and Shio Song. <laughs> he's looking at Taishi Kong and he just says in his head, I'm done for. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. But like, I don't know. The way it was delivered it was almost like a little comedic for some reason to me. Uh, just as Taishi Kong's about to strike down Chiel Song, Jinu arrives to save the day. You know, you do wonder you know, if he, want, he doesn't want people to find out about his secret. How far is he willing to go for that secret? And it looks like he is going to defend uh, his uh, party members here, which I'm happy about. Uh, Taishi Kong is totally confused and asks, who are you? And Jinu replies, Jinu Song, E-Rank Hunter. Sean, you mean he's not going to hold back like in Superman Man of Steel where Superman's dad's like, no, don't save me, but also let this puppy and other things die? <laughs> I, yeah, I always uh, found that a little confusing. Yeah, they made some questionable choices in that movie in general. But I, I loved Jinu's introduction. Like he was supposed to, he was trying to make it sound so badass. But the inclusion of E Rank Hunter and the reaction that got was hilarious. It's like, yeah, I'm a badass now. I'm an E Rank Hunter, and like you could just hear like the snickering of <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna beat me you're an e-rank hunter i guess that's what makes it so cool right is that like e-rank hunter and he's like dude you're about to get bodied by an e-rank hunter how's that gonna feel i could see that it was just the the snickering and laughter sort of made it lost its luster to me uh taishi gong gives some speculation on what he thinks is going on with you a power type could block that hit uh, maybe a regular type could, you know, someone else could block the hit. But a power type, you know, blocking a hit is more likely. But unfortunately, like, but, but crazy enough, his his reaction speed is that of an assassin build. The build doesn't really seem to matter, though, because he's obviously been hiding his skills. The group knows each other, so it rules out Gina being a false ranker. Because false rankers lie and kill the groups they're in. They usually don't let other people know that they're false rankers. But it only leaves one explanation. Second Awakening. Juhi and Chiel Sung are blown away by this news. Remark that it must have been from the Double Dungeon. Taishi Kong recalls the E-Ranker he measured in the hospital uh, that went through the Double Dungeon. He's like an entirely different person now. It doesn't matter how the Awakening happened, because Jin is about to get a master class in hunting. Hearing Song Sheik talk about the builds was really cool in my opinion. It's like, oh yeah, if you're an assassin build, you can do this. And if you have a strength power build, you can do this. Like, it was just cool. It had that video game feel to it. Strangely enough, of all the, uh, you know, video game talk, I never thought about each person having a different build setup. I don't know why. It just never crossed my mind. And I was like, huh. I found that very interesting as well that he's like, oh, well, there's a strength build and there's a magic build and there's a healer build. And I don't know. It just never crossed my mind that, you know, I, I thought maybe you could like kind of choose a path you're going down, but I guess you just get what you get when you awaken. Yeah, you awaken and you're assigned to a class, right? You know, when you play back to this MMO, you know, logic, right? Um, you're a healer, you're a DPS, you're a tank, stuff like that. So I got a spinoff show then. You awaken as a class that, you know, does not suit your your personality or, or your your lifestyle. So like you got to adjust to do the opposite of what you would naturally want to do. There's a spinoff show. I feel like Chiel Song kind of matches that though. You know how he's like really into kendo and he like really enjoys like sword fighting techniques, but he's like a mage. And if this dude was like an assassin or a hunter, Imagine like how much more effective he'd probably be as a hunter if he could actually use those techniques for sword fighting like out in the field. Very true. I mean, we could get a whole uh, you know, prequel show about him. Jinu asks for an explanation instead of a class. Taishi Kong gives a story about the money and claims it was social justice. Jinu calls out the torture that went to the killings. That's not social justice. Taishi Kong shows us the rest of his conversation with the briber. Uh, he reveals that he just enjoys killing. Our battle begins. 
That face Taishi made when saying it's more fun to kill people than beasts was creepy as hell. It reminded me of uh, the statue. Yeah, that's a good call out. That big creepy smile. Yep. A statue certainly did enjoy killing people. <laughs> it did it a lot. During the fight. We highlight both fighters' ability. Uh, I'm sorry, both fighters' agility and ability, I guess, with some commentary from all characters about the skill levels. After an initial exchange that Tai Chi Kong dominates, Gino asks if Tai Chi Kong uh, could be a little less bloodthirsty, as the system has noticed now, and given him a new objective. Uh, you know, one of those uh, kill the people who are trying to kill you quests. Um, but we, we also note that it's the first, it may be the first time that Gina's really mentioned the system out loud. Uh, and Taishi Kong has no clue what that is. Gina dashes and gets in a cut. His dagger inflicted poison that makes Taishi Kong's eye completely red. Taishi Kong uses a stealth ability and goes invisible. He gives a monologue the entire time, which is fun for the viewer, but it kind of makes the, the whole stealth ability kind of not very effective. Uh, so I, I don't know what to think about that. Anyway, Tai Chi Kong has dominated this next leg of battle. Juno looks like he's having a hard time. Then again, he has a cheat code. Full recovery. Tai Chi Kong has never seen anything like this. Quote from Jinu. That's another my emotions gone. I don't even need to feel anger to kill filth like you. With that speech, Tai Chi Kong calls out that Gino has also killed people. They're in the same biz. Chiyo Song calls out that Jinu has most likely made a uh, number of hard decisions in a small amount of time to have changed this much. Taishi Kong gives a speech about how the strongest come out on top. Jinu is able to block Taishi Kong's attacks even while using stealth. Jinu uses his murderous intent ability with a very cool animation. It, uh, Taishi Kong appears dramatically slowed down. And then uh, a dagger just appears and stabs him right through the chest. I was really surprised that Jinu talked about the system out loud. Like, you would think, hey, there's other people. Like, it would make be one thing if it was just him and Taishik, but it's like, there are multiple people here. Like, maybe you keep that under wraps. I don't know. At the same time, like, he's talking to his objective that he has to kill. And the other two people behind him actually like him and care about him. So I don't think that they're going to betray him. But that's my thought. Really dug the stealth skill. But yes, Sean, you're right. He probably shouldn't have been talking. It's like, okay, you're fully stealth, but you're talking. So he could just hear where your voice is coming from. A true villain has to monologue <laughs> a lot. Uh, really dug both the poison affecting Taishik's eye. And the visual of when Jinu used murderous intent, like both top notch visuals. Yeah, absolutely. Really great animation, especially with the murderous intent. I really liked how they made that look, you know, the big blue eyes. It, it was just, yeah, two thumbs up. I loved it. And then I also found it interesting. Like, Sean, I'm glad you wrote down that quote about the system stripping. Like, Stripping another one of Jinu's emotions. And he doesn't need emotion to kill filth like Tai Sheik. Like, it makes me wonder if the system's just going to plan on stripping Jinu of all of his emotions. So he's just, like, pretty much a computer program. That's a cool thought. I, I, I honestly am wondering, is the system removing his emotions? Or is he just sort of blocking his feelings so he can power through this because he has to? My initial thought is that second one, Turtle. I think that uh, I think his emotions are just going away because I think when it comes to, I uh, you know, uh, admission on the podcast here, I've never killed another human being. Um, so I guess I don't know what it's like. But I, I would uh, hope I would I, hope that. <laughs> also, it if can... you're admit if you're admitting that you did kill someone on a podcast, uh, we might have to edit that out. Yeah, but may, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe the podcast would get a lot more popular. <laughs> It gets easier after each one. So I've been told, of course. <laughs> from, In from fact, a, after enough, you start to like it. <laughs> from, from reading some some murder mystery books in uh, 
research purposes. Definitely have not done it at all. Of course. Of course. We watch anime. These things happen. Yeah, I kind of like the, the O.J. Simpson book, you know, Rest in Peace, I guess. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't kill Taishi Gong, but if I did, here's how I would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I forgot where we were. Let's move on. <laughs> Taishi Gong gives a death speech. And I quote, Hunters thrive in combat, so no mo- normal morals don't apply. And you're just the same. Goes for all hunters. Basically, we're killing machines, right? So all die because it's natural selection. The strongest one makes the rules, and I lost to you. But what are you? End quote. After some banter, Gina reveals that he gets stronger after every battle. That's the type of hunter he is. Tashi Gong replies with, Then your shadow must stretch into some really nasty places. Oh, he'll probably get as strong as those places are dark. I suggest you watch it, though. If you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. Oh, this speech thought ominous as hell. Love me a good death speech. Gina gets a notification of his quest completion to defeat the enemies. He gets five ability points and a runestone for stealth. I imagine that the runestone is going to teach him how to use that stealth ability. Gino has an inner monologue about how the stronger he gets, the more something inside of him falls apart. He's thanked by the two survivors. Gino then goes and wrecks the boss by himself. We don't even see the fight. After the gate closes, we're shown Hunters Association members, Manager Wu, and that one woman who always collects the reports when people die. I don't know her name. We were surprised that Taishi Gong was a serial killer and that he didn't do a good enough job as his manager. We immediately noticed his genius presence and how he got taller. Oh, so everyone's noticing that he got taller. Uh, Wu gets right to business, though, and he asks who actually defeated him. The group covers for Jinu. Chiyo Song, with a few good buffs from Juhi, was able to make it work. Wu seems skeptical, but he can't do anything about it. Jinu looks at Wu and realizes he's an A rank. So there's nothing Gina would be able to do against him. Gina is thankful that Chiyo Sung bailed him out and kept his cover. I wonder how many more times we'll see people cover for Jinu, or people will just assume that it was the other other hunters in the party that deserve all the praise instead of Jinu. It's like eventually this shtick has to run out. Yeah, I agree. I, I feel like they can't really do this too many more times if at all like all the focus seems to be pointing at Jinu at this point so I, it's it's gonna it's gonna come out sooner or later three hours later taishi kong's briber was arrested uh, he turned himself in uh and that confirmed that the party acted in self-defense right because he had the bribe to kill the prisoners and um it all comes together right so uh juhi is walking with Jinu and holds out a monster crystal. It reminds him of their deal. It's dinner time. Ship, ship, ship. Ship, ship, ship. We're going to ship our way over to Mike Spear of the Week. Thanks, Sean. And like you said, it's time for Mike's Spear of the Week. <sighs> this week's beer comes to you from Spoonwood Brewing. And it is their Reach Out Touch Haze. A 6.8% hazy IPA loaded with Eldorado, Nelson, Citra, and Mosaic Hops. This beer absolutely rolls. I was at Spoonwood with a party of about 8 of us. And I'm pretty sure at least half of us ordered this beer, if not more. And we all absolutely loved it. If you're in the Pittsburgh area, swing by Spoonwood. Order yourself a draft of this beer. You won't be disappointed. The untapped average rating is a 4.03, and I give it a 3.75. Episode 10. What is this, a picnic? Juhi and Jinu have a chat and reflect on how they've each changed. Juhi admits that 
she stuck with D and E ranked dungeons, even though she should have been able to do more. She also used to think Genu's poor abilities were annoying, but then she started enjoying their time together and liked how he never gave up. She attempts to hand him back the crystal and announces that she doesn't need it anymore as she's retiring as a hunter and moving back home. This peeved me greatly. However, we'll get to that at the end here. <laughs> uh, maybe we see her again someday, but uh, we're shown a flashback to Wu, who explains who Dong Su Wong is. He's an S rank who absolutely wants Jin Ho and Jinu dead. S rankers aren't bound by laws, and they can choose to bring about miracles or absolute destruction. Wu suggests leaving the country. Jinu resolves to become even stronger. And we roll the opening theme. I love how Juhi is dressed so nicely for what I thought was going to be their dinner. And Jinu is just in some basic ass clothes. It's like, dude, you can't advance a ship looking like that. And then when she went to leave, he should have said something to her to keep her around. Whether it be, no, you're a great hunter, you're a great healer, like, say something, my man. Like, don't just let her walk out the door without fighting for her. It's clear that there are vibes between the two of you. Yeah, so this is um this is incredibly disappointing. Uh we got a strong character who was like, you know, she she's a B rank hunter, right? So she is pretty far in level. And it, uh, isn't that what Taishik was, right? I believe so. Yes. Yeah, Taishik was a, a B rank as well. So um, pretty strong. And especially as a healer, you know, you think that, okay, well, she'd be able to do heal and buffs. And I thought it'd be really cool if maybe um, he started gathering a, a strike force or a guild of his own. I thought that would have been a pretty good story, right? Like gather some competent hunters, you know, um, work with Juhi and get her more experience in the dungeons and get her more confidence. You know, um, you have Jin Ho, who is, uh, you know, he, he has like, you know, he's ranked D he has all this armor and he has the money to essentially make himself a B or C rank, uh, because of how strong, uh, you know, his money cheat is. And then Chiyo Song, you could have seen him as like an interesting, like, um, strike team leader or strategist, um who could occasionally rifle off a spell i'm like man we could have like a really sick party dynamic here would have been really fun um instead it looks like they yeah you know, i mentioned it before any character who's not named genu is worthless in this show um there's just no reason to remember with their name because it seems like they just pop in and out of this series at least jinho is uh you know making some reappearances but um yeah, it looks like Chiyo Song's probably done here, and it looks like um, Juhi is also just done here, and um, I find it to be very disappointing. And that is why they call it solo leveling, not party leveling. Crap. <laughs> I, I mean, to be honest, I, I like your idea a lot better, Sean. I, I, I wish that they would stick around and you know work together and be a team, and that would be, I think, much more fun than just watching one guy get stronger and BOP. I, I would prefer the group dynamic, but it is not to be. Yeah, you ever like uh when you're growing up and like you uh you go to a friend's house, right? And uh your friend has like a really cool like RPG and they want you to check it out, right? And they're playing with the story and like you don't mind watching your friend play the game because it's like really interesting, right? You know, you're like, oh well there's a cool plot here, like the design's really fun, the battle is at least engaging. So like yeah, if I'm if I don't have a controller in my hand, I could still kind of have like a good time just hanging out for an hour or two and like watching my friend play a game, right? But in this case, you know, it's like you ever watch your friend just level grind? Yeah, not fun. It's super boring. Yeah, exactly. W watching your friend grind out levels, uh, it's boring to play. You gotta imagine it's ten times as boring to watch. Um, so, you know, this show, uh, what drives me into a show is the story and the characters. And right now, they the story is actually somewhat engaging. I kind of like I still want to see where it goes, but the characters have done nothing to draw me in. Um, every attempt they've had to make me interested in like an S ranker or any of these side characters, um, there just isn't much there. Honestly, the most interesting character is probably Jin Ho, um, which, mm, yeah, not not the uh, 
<laughs> not a ringing endorsement from me. Uh, but I'm not saying the show's bad. Like I said, I like the story. It's just that I felt like there was a lot of wasted potential with some of these characters they introduced early and seemed to be also writing out of the show early. Or maybe it's just the nature of the show. The other part of that is that, um, you know, you can't move in rank unless you have an awakening, right? So maybe it's just that characters who aren't S rank are soon going to become not very important. It could just be that way. And maybe we are going to find the S rank characters who we're going to care about very soon uh, as, as Gina levels up. But we're not quite there yet. So uh, until then, I would have loved to see some characters I could care about in the long term. Yeah, I agree with that. It feels very difficult to care about some of these characters just because it's they appear for an episode or two and then they peace out. Jinu and Jinho might be in some serious trouble, though, with dong Su being an S-rank hunter and the laws not applying to him. I kind of chuckled when they they said that, like, oh, S-ranks. Yeah, no, the they don't they don't have to follow any rules. I'm like, well, that's silly. And then I'm like, wait a minute, they're so powerful, nobody can do anything to stop them. So I I guess it makes sense. Yeah, it's like uh, you know, you know, Homelander. Uh, if you if you're a fan of the boys, I do. Yeah, Homelander from the boys is just like that. You know, like, okay, sure, he's essentially like the S rank hero, right? But like, if he does something wrong, who's gonna stop him? He'll just murder anyone who does try to stop him. Right, and that's how, that's kind of how I view the S-Ranks here, is they're so powerful that, like, traditional military force can't even stop an S-Ranker. So it's just like, you know, you just kind of have to hope that they're a good guy. Jin Ho and Jinu's quest for 19 completed gates has begun! You need eight to go into a gate, so they've hired six more people. To picnic, drink, and play games outside of gates while Jinho and Jinu go into the gates and close them up. <laughs> Where can I get that job? <laughs> yeah, and they're making, uh, you know, I have my exchange rate thing here. Hold up. Uh, they're making $3 million a gate, right? Is that what they said? Yes. I think so. That's about 2200 bucks, right? So let's take 2200 multiplied by how many gates are they doing this for? Are we doing 20. the other 19 gates, right? Oh, yeah, 19. Yeah. The other nineteen gates. Yeah. Um. Imagine making. Imagine making over forty one thousand dollars, just sitting around on your butt, like picnicking, while uh, other people do the work. I mean, I would take that job for forty thousand bucks over the course of a couple weeks. Sign me up. Yeah. Where Where do I go to sign that? Uh, sign that contract. I'm in. Okay, Turo. You can sign the contract for forty thousand dollars for a few days of doing nothing, or. Well, I'm sorry, but the stipulation is that gates open up all over Earth with monsters in them. Well, if I'm not going in, why do I care? I guess that's true. <laughs> I'll sign the deal. Give me the money. We we could use gates on this Earth, right? We could use gates on this Earth. Yeah. As long as gets paid. Exactly. I will warm that bench like it's never been warmed. Give me a shot. Put me in, coach. Speaking of bench warmers, uh, Songi Han, uh, Gina's friend from school. She's here, and we revealed that she was an E-ranker last time. Um, she wants to go into the gate, even though she's a minor. Uh, apparently, you're allowed to go if you've awakened, even though you're a minor. Uh, but they're not going to let her go, because only they want to go. Another hunter asks, if, is it really okay to collect that money just by sitting around? And Jinho says, hey, man, $3 million for each raid, as long as you keep your mouth shut. Uh, you've signed a non-disclosure agreement that says uh, you have to pay back 10 times. Will we pay you if uh, you know if if you uh, don't keep your mouth shut? Pretty much, sounds like an ironclad contract. Sign me up for this strike team. I'm in. But I, I love Gino's thinking for putting this strike team together. It's like, yeah, they're all hunters. They just can't do anything right now. So it's the perfect group to hire. I also thought it was kind of silly. Maybe it's just me. Like I understand. Like if you talk, you have to pay back ten times the amount. What if what if they just like disappear? They move to another country. Like how are you going to find them so they can pay back the money? I mean that's like any contract here, right? Fair. Gino's dad's so rich that I'm sure he has ways that he could find people. Yeah, I mean you could you could hire like a detective or, or something like that to hunt him down. So that that's true. It just, it sounded silly to me the first time I heard it. Oh, pay back ten times. I'm just going to ghost, man. <laughs> yeah, 40K is not enough to ghost, though. 
Um, yeah, you can tell just by the way they do things for Jinho's family. There's definitely some organized crime vibes that come off of these guys, I feel like. Maybe you think differently, but I, I kind of feel like they're not afraid to use a little force here. I didn't really think about that, but it does make sense. Juno activates the stealth stone he got after the last battle to learn the stealth ability. Honestly, I don't know why he waited. Maybe it was just for um, dramatic effect. Uh, Jinho appears to be ready to raid in uh, even more incredibly expensive gear. It's buff-boosting armor that was special ordered from Italy. Jinu pushes over Jinho with a single finger, and Jinho just can't get up on his own. Jinu demands he takes off that armor. This new suit of armor is so ridiculous. I was laughing my ass off as soon as I saw it. Like, it's like, oh yeah, look at this sweet armor I just got from Italy, and it does all these buffs, and blah 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 blah. And just like, finger poke of doom. Oh, you can't get up? That's a shame. The banter between these two are just, it's just fantastic. The whole suit of armor thing is such a cliche, but it makes me laugh every time. So keep doing it, I guess, everybody. <laughs> it, it, when I saw the armor, it, it, it's such a, at a ridiculous level. I mean, I expect to see that since it came from Italy, I expected to, to see something like that on like a Rhapsody of Fire album cover. You know, there's a dragon guy in a suit of armor fighting a dragon. It just, it fits perfectly. They're about to go into the gate. Juno can't believe, uh, he can't give up the helmet, at least. Uh, Juno's like, I thought I told you to take that off. And he's like, let me have this one. He's like, okay, that's fine. Whatever. And they go into the portal. Uh, the hunters are glad they were paid ahead of time, because a and e rank clearing the dungeon seems pretty unlikely. It normally takes about two hours to clear a C-rank gate with a full party, so they should get comfy. However, Jinho and Jinu emerge, and everyone thinks they must have run away. Instead, the gate closes, and they're ready to move on to the next boss. Two more dungeons to clear today. Everyone is completely blown away by this. So this might just be weird animating but it looked like the raid started at three o'clock and then it finished at 4 40 and we got a cut to gina at wondering if song yi is skipping school for the day what high school is starting school at three o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> i hadn't even thought about that when they flashed that over i wouldn't think once she had noticed by now I didn't either, but maybe it's just like they maybe they only have one class together and it's at, you know, three in the afternoon. I don't know. I'm trying to make excuses for the show. I don't know why. Uh, next is one of our favorites. I, I, I missed these from Free Ren because uh, it felt like every episode of Free Ren, we got a montage. I think we did. Yeah. So like I, I um. I am very happy to have a montage here. And we get one for dungeon clearing. Uh, it was super fun. We see a few types of dungeons and monsters we've never seen before. Plus, Jinu gets a ton of level ups. It's also revealed that he's leveled up his dash skill to level 2. He also has new fatal strike and advanced dagger wielding abilities. He feels unstoppable. I loved the dungeon clearing montage. And just like the two of you said, I really miss our weekly montages. Yeah, I miss the free run, everything. Uh, but this this was a good montage, so I'll give them that. They this they carried the the montage spirit from free run over to solo leveling. It just took a really long time to get one, but it was very good. It was well done. While Jinho loots the bodies, Jinu wonders if he should enter the demon castle. He realizes it's a bad idea at the moment. He gets a notification that he has unlocked a job change quest. A job change quest, you say? I wonder what that will entail. Hum, interesting. We cut away to a few people discussing that someone has bought up a ton of C-rank gates at an insanely high price. It's obviously Jinho's family company, because that's what we've been talking about, right? Them going to C-rank gates. This causes some problems for the guild's because their C rank hunters have nothing to do. They just sit around because there's no gate. Noted in the sales, though, Jinu uh, happens to be, I guess, on the roster. I uh, don't know actually why you would have to list someone on the roster. Maybe whenever you buy a gate, you have to prove that you have eight people to go in. 
Uh, so noted there is uh, is Genu. Uh, and the guy going over the numbers has heard of Genu as the double dungeon guy. I guess word about it spread further than I thought. This guy feels that something else is going on here, and he has a look of ambition. Another day, another set of gates. Gina looks at Song Yi and asks, What? And she says, Nothing, when she's looking at him. Uh, I don't know what they think they're doing with Song Yi's character, but we don't know anything about her motivations or why she has an attitude. Will we learn eventually, like, what her deal is? It, it is weird because it almost felt like in the early episode she had, like, a crush on Jinu or something. Like, she was always asking about him. And now, like, they're on the same page and she's, like, there's the whole attitude thing. It's just, it's very weird. One, she does have a crush on him. Two, she's a teenager. Good points. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, to be fair, though, um, ever since Genu got, like, six inches taller and uh, got ultra buff, uh, uh, he's now entitled to a harem by anime logic, right? <laughs> That's fair. So um, just assume that any female character who enters the screen will eventually fall in love with Genu. Um, not because that's how being a woman actually works, but because that's how anime writing works. Uh, but going back to Song Yi, though... Uh, she's an E-rank hunter, and my prediction is that she can't get any better, right? Uh, so my prediction now is that she'll probably just get get uh, she'll probably just get killed off to drive the narrative or to drive Genu's feelings. Um, y- you know what I mean? Like I feel like she's just there to give feelings about when she's gonna die. Uh, unless they do something with her soon, though, I'm going to wish her character didn't exist at all because I find her annoying currently. Does Jinu recognize Song Yi and just not like make mention of it? Or like, does he like, I'm confused, like, because we don't have a lot of background on these two characters together. It's like, does he recognize her? Does he not recognize her? Like, what's going on here? I, I don't think that he recognized her at all because, I mean, when they first were like meeting each other, he was like, is that a kid? So, I mean, if, if he knew who she was, he would have been like, hey, aren't you so-and-so? You're my sister's friend. I just don't think that uh, he knows who his sister hangs out with at all. I was going to say, I, I also didn't think he recognized her. And I'm like, okay, but like that's your sister's best friend. I'm sure she's been over to the house. I'm sure she's asked about like your mom. Like Growing up, I may not have known all of my brother's friends, but like... If they came over to the house, I would have, and I saw them out and about, I would have recognized them. The only logic I can put to this is since he is a terrible hunter, he was always in gates, followed immediately by long hospital trips. So he never met any of his sister's friends. I don't know. That's a stretch. Yeah, I mean, my brothers had a, had some friends who like I have never met. So it wouldn't surprise me if he just didn't really know who she was. And, um, Though I was curious, I mean, she knows Gina's, um, like, surname, like, family name, so why would, it, yeah, I wonder if she could put it together that Jinu has the same surname, or maybe, maybe Song is a uh, pretty popular surname, and she doesn't connect it there, related in any way. Hard to say. Um, either way, I don't like what they're doing with her, so I hope she does something interesting soon. I'm sure she'll fade away like all the others. It's either fade away or death. My guess is death. <laughs> Morbid. Uh, back to the two randos who were investigating the C rank gate purchases. One of the guys has been taking notes. Uh, has been taking note of Genu. He references the double dungeon, the Dong Suk Wong incident, and the Tai Chi Kong murder spree. He theorizes that Genu has undergone a second awakening, and he's gonna go scout him. I love how this random dude is like a major league baseball scout looking for the next great prospect that no one has heard of and trying to sign them to his team. I mean, I guess it makes sense. You have all these different uh, guilds and they're trying to strengthen themselves as a guild. So you want new powerful members. So it makes sense to have a group of, uh, you know, people or, or a team looking for others to bring into the fold. It makes a lot of sense from that respect. Um, and honestly, uh, the 
the reference to MLB Scout makes me like this character more than three-fourths of the characters that we've met. Uh, our scouts arrive at a gate to a bizarre scene. There's a picnic happening outside the gate. Song Yi confronts the two men and asks them to leave. They ask if she's a hunter. She says yes, and they assume she's part of the strike team. She looks embarrassed like she's just been tricked into admitting information she shouldn't have given. Our scout lets out a gotcha in his mind. His hypothesis was correct. Gino must be inside, clearing out that dungeon. The scouts apologize, then they walk away. Jin Ho and Jinu leave the gate. It's time to move on to the next. They discuss the next day. Uh, they discuss taking the next day off. And Jin Ho says, that's okay. The scout was eavesdropping the entire time. We get a, a cutaway to a bizarre scene with flames and skeletons. There's a giant ant and a person watching another person get burned up in flames. It was a dream being had by Jong In Choi, S rank hunter. He holds up a paper that says Operations Plan Reconnaissance Mission of Jeju Island. Looks like this is going to be a huge plot point. Jin Woo is definitely going to this island, isn't he? Guaranteed. We talked about it last time. He's just going to clear it on his own. Solo leveling. Exactly. <laughs> He's the only character that matters. We learned that our main scout's name is uh, Song Min An, who is the manager of the second administration team of the White Tiger Guild. He takes Gino to a cafe and gives him a sales pitch. He'll pay double what Eugene Construction does. Gino asks about the White Tiger HQ. Uh, asks what the White Tiger HQ building is worth. He reveals that he was offered thirty billion dollars by Eugene Construction. Gino has proof of this contract right there. He, I guess he shows him his phone. Uh, poor Songmin gets shot down so fast. He thinks he was too desperate. Uh, but before Jinu leaves, he asks Songmin how he knows about him. It's not because he's been snooping around, is it? And then Jinu gives him a uh, pretty evil look when he says that. Jinu uses stealth and he disappears and he cuts Songmin's face. Just a little bit. Songmin apologizes and explains the C rank gate crisis, leading him to Jinu. Uh, Songmin agrees to keep Jinu's secret because he knows if he doesn't, he'll die. Jinu offers Songmin a deal for three C rank gates, 300 million apiece. Uh, he asks, well, he says that the most materials you really ever get out of a C rank gate is 200 million. So he asks if he could go down to 200 million so they could break even. Jinu eagerly accepts. As a parting gift, Jinu has the guy close his mouth and open. Sorry, close his eyes and open his mouth, not close his mouth and open his eyes. <laughs> close his eyes and open his mouth. Uh, Jinu dumps a little bit of healing potion, what I assume is healing potion. It's kind of weird. It's just like it's in like a test tube. Um, and I'm like, what? I'm like, what? What is this? If it's a, if it's a healing potion, it's probably in a in a uh, in a bottle. But whatever it is, uh, he pours it into the guy's mouth, and the wound uh, he, that Jinu had given him heals. They both reveal that they trust each other, but Songmin also reveals that Jinu is the biggest score they may have ever seen. This poaching of Jinu went so poorly, and Jinu was so damn spooky when he used the stealth skill. And bringing up that health potion, was I the only one who thought it was Jinu's blood at first? <laughs> I was going to say, it, it's as red as blood. I'm like, what? what did you give him? Like, it was red, and it was viscous. Like, it's like, um, are we using your own blood to heal people now? That feels like a cult. I thought it was a health potion, but in my eyes, I'm like, I, I guess in my eyes, he's like the Diablo logic. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, red is health potion. Blue is mana potion. And for some reason in my mind, that's just how it works. I'm like, oh, yeah, red liquid, definitely health potion. I promise it won't hurt. Gina was on the phone with Jinho. He reveals that Jinho was going to cancel the gates anyway, uh, and that Jinu really ripped someone off. Songmin sees there are a ton of C rank gates now available between 50 and 70 million apiece. Looks like Jinu really conned him. Songmin's phone vibrates, and he assumes he's getting fired. <laughs> he's like, oh, the boss is calling. I'm done. <laughs> it's Jinu who says, With this, we're even. I'll forget the fact that you spied on me. 
Songmin thinks it was worth it to gain his contact info and trust. We cut away to Jinu, who is driving to the mountains to undertake the job change quest. I totally thought Sangmin was losing his job. And I mean, he still might. Yeah, who knows? He's He still could. There's two episodes left. I'd say Jinu's not the only one undertaking a job change quest, potentially. <laughs> uh, but yeah, what what'd you guys think about these two episodes? Go ahead, Turtle. Sure. Um, I like these two a lot more than last week's episodes. Um, I just think the, the flow was better. There was less cutting away that meant nothing. And uh, some pretty great uh, fight sequences. We got a montage again. So yeah, I, I think these were uh, two thumbs up for me. I pretty much agree with every sentiment that Turtle just shared. I thought they were great episodes. The flow was much better. It had a better pace to it. The action was good. I wish we would have saw the boss fight in that dungeon. That sort of sucked to not see. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, I thought these were fantastic episodes. Yeah, and I'll say myself that uh, even though you know I, I complain a little bit about some of the things like oh this ca- uh, the characters aren't as strong as I want them to be or you know um, the, the episodes are like still entertaining to me and that's what I'm asking for at the end of the day is that I'd like to be entertained and so leveling has done a good job and, and especially these two episodes I loved the whole concept of them going through the dungeons together and then like hopping like you know driving up from location to location and just like murdering these dungeons. Like that was really interesting to me, and I thought it was a really fun concept we hadn't seen in the show so far. So they're doing just enough variation with the activities to keep me interested. Uh, so yeah, uh, two two pretty solid episodes. And now it is time for the waifu of the week. Turtle. Who is your wife of the week? This week, I'm going to go with Juhi again. Um, I, I really respect her desire to try to get out of the funk that she's in after the double dungeon. It was a horrifying experience. It killed most of the party, maimed many of the others, and, you know, she was able to escape with her life and without being, you know, missing limbs or anything. But it did, in fact, leave a scar. And she's basically, like, been huddled up in her room ever since. And she's been afraid to go into a dungeon to do her job as a hunter. So I admire her wanting to get out of that funk, get back into the field. And, uh, you know, sadly, it did not go her way. So I also respect where she's like, I just can't do this anymore. I have to retire and find a new job so i I respect that as well like hey look this just isn't working out for me i gotta change gears i gotta do something else i was a little bummed with the last sentence she said though that i'm going back home like she can get a job in the city that she's living in now you don't have to be a hunter go do something else you're a healer right go work at a hospital you can heal people you like you don't have to go back home that was a bummer um but, you know, just her, her strength of character, I think, uh, for as little interaction as we've had with her and how little we've seen of her, I like that she's trying to better herself. And she also realizes her own limitations. Like, I just can't do this. I'm not cut out for this. I got to do something else. I just don't know why she is going back home. Mike, your waifu of the week. I'm going to go with the freeloading C rank hunters. They're getting paid, what did you say? 40 grand? in u.s dollars yeah yeah for, for the whole of the whole endeavor over 40 grand like sign me up for that it's like here have a free 40 grand yep that's the dream they're my wife of the week because i wish that was me i'm jealous and for me my wife of the week is chiel song he's a one-armed sword wielding flame conjuring secret holding tough as nails son of a gun Woo! thank you for the woo Thank you all for joining us this week as we watched Solo Leveling. We hope you'll join us next week for episode 60 of the Anime Banter Podcast, where we will watch episodes 11 and 12 of Solo Leveling. Please give us a five-star review on all platforms that allow reviews. If you're listening on YouTube, please like the video, hit the notification bell, and leave a comment. 
The Anime Banter Podcast can be found on Facebook, X, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you all for joining, and we will talk to you next week. Thank you.